Tonight's the fourth lecture of this uh, series, uh, the last years of the Old Order Israel on the Jews, 1966. Tonight's encounter JFK and LBJ. If you don't know who that is, get out. Uh, Israel and the USA, 62 to 66. If you remember last time we talked about Soviet Jewry, I, said, I still remember from my youth, I heard something with Bob Hope, and I found the son of a gun on, on the YouTube. Anything, you can, anything uh, that was ever in our past is now online somewhere. Take a look at this. President Kennedy has already sent a message in the teletype. He wired Khrushchev, get out of Berlin, get out of Vietnam, and get out of Cuba. Khrushchev wired back, never mind that. How can I get out of Russia? <laughs> so, kidneys, kidneys. Okay, tonight we talk about John F. Kennedy for starters. And I do want to, I, I'm very interested in the sound. She'll work with that, but extended piece of something I want you to hear uh, a little bit later. Um, as, I don't have to tell this audience, the first problem that happened when Kennedy ran for president was people were afraid of his father. In the immortal words of Harry S. Truman, yeah. <laughs> you understand? Uh, old man Kennedy brought a, uh, a lot of anti Semitic baggage to it. Uh, here is. Here is the old uh, son of a gun himself, Kennedy's father. You can't rearm in your spare time any more than you can fight a war in your spare time. We ourselves can accomplish more than any bill can accomplish if we unite for our common cause. And that is what's best for the United States. You don't have to hear that much about it. He was testifying against sending... He was testifying against sending weapons to help Churchill against Hitler. <laughs> right? I'll say it again. He was testifying against the lend lease. Okay? So, what else is new? Uh, that's why Truman. That's okay. We get the idea. The next, the, the next one you listen to, I found a little piece from the recent biographer, a Jewish guy, of uh, Joe Kennedy, uh, David Nassau, I think his name is. Um, and he addresses specifically for a minute or so the issue of uh, who exactly Joe Kenny was. And by the way, he wasn't simply, as he'll make a point, he wasn't simply a Hitler type or something like that. He was an American version of an anti-Semite, which is uh, uh, somewhat a little bit different. And um, I think he says it very well. Let's hear. Kennedy was not in that sense. But what Kennedy was, was Kennedy, as time went on, absorbed every anti-Semitic myth, every anti-Semitic mythology. He used language, made speeches that were virulently and frighteningly anti-Semitic. He believed that the organized Jewish community, not all Jews, but the most powerful ones, including those in the White House, Frankfurter, or close to the White House, Frankfurter, Brandeis, Benjamin Cohn, Sam Rosenman, they were all, they were doing everything they possibly could to push the United States into war against Germany to somehow get revenge against Hitler. He believed the Jews were warmongers, they were looking after only their own tribal interests, they were not patriotic, Nothing was more important to him than making sure that there was no war. Keeping Britain out of the war first, and then keeping the United States out of the war. And he did everything he possibly could. He violated protocol. He didn't follow orders. He met secretly with German diplomats. He was convinced that as a businessman, he knew how to negotiate a deal. And that if he were put in a room with Hitler, the two of them would negotiate a deal. He refused to see that Hitler was a madman. And by the way, that, what he's saying there is accurate. I, no, I want you to, just to be clear before we move on. It's old man Joe Kennedy, was, when he was ambassador in England, he said like this, the big problem is, the, listen closely, the big problem is the Jews. I can cut a deal with the Nazis, get the Jews out of Europe, send them somewhere else, and then America won't have any pressure to go to war against Hitler. So... That might have worked, you know, except that what Hitler went along with that, we could have a nice discussion about that. So it's not simply like, you know, shoot every Jew or something like that. On the other hand, he certainly came in with a lot of baggage, as, as you can see. Now, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was an aristocrat. 
He's born in a millionaire family. His, his, his father, in, in the typical American fashion, made the money himself. You know, he didn't come from an a aristocratic background. But he made sure his kids lived a high life in, in, in um, Hyannisport and over there and sent them to the best schools and to best uh, and Harvard and, and, and so forth and the prep schools. And he gave them extra tutors to make sure that they got the best grades. And he hobnobbed with the rich and the famous on purpose. So, no, this is a guy who grew up sort of groomed for the presidency more than a Lyndon Johnson or, or an Obama or somebody like that. You get what I'm saying? As a young person coming up, John Fitzgerald Kennedy met with the high and the mighty. He hobbled out with the famous. He went around the world a bunch of times, which people didn't usually get a chance to do because his father was, had endless money. He also was incredibly sick. And if he wasn't able, because of his money, to get the very best cutting-edge medical attention in the 20s and the 30s, because that's what he got. He got the top-line stuff at the highest money in the 20s and 30s. Obviously, that's almost a century ago, I understand. But he had a lot of problems, and he was able to grow up and sort of... Uh, get healed as much as medicine could do at that time because he went to these super fancy clinics and got full-time treatment and nurses and doctors galore all around him. He could, it wasn't available to the average American, but it was available to him. That's how he survived, frankly, because he had a lot of things wrong with him. And uh, the reason I mention all this is he went around the world a bunch of times. He was able to do. He was always interested in social affairs. Here he is visiting Palestine in, in 1939. Isn't that interesting? Okay, he went to British mandates. So he was not unaware of the Israel situation. He was there during the time of the Arab Intifada when it was just about to be crushed by the British army. He's talking to a British officer over there. He toured through Palestine. He writes letters back home to his father about the Jews versus the Arabs and the Palestinians and the Mufti and Ben Gurion and all the rest of it. I'm just trying to show you he was a very well connected. And uh, this is what his father wanted from his kids. He wanted them to have the best of everything, so that one day he can be the president of the United States, and after that, the king of the world. You know, and uh, so he, he gave him that sort of thing. Joe Kennedy, um, I'm, I'm going to be clear, was as the ambassador to Britain under Roosevelt's second term, that would be 37, 38, 39, 40, four years. So when he was over there, uh, England was ruling Palestine, Hitler was on the rise, he, Kennedy was the opposite of dumb, he knew what's happening, and he dealt, I mean, I want you to understand, he had a lot of meetings with Chaim Weizmann, he had a lot of meetings with Jabotinsky, a lot of means with, with all kinds of Arab and Jewish leaders, uh, leaders from the Agoda, by the way, uh, all of whom were trying to get back out of, England, uh, out of Europe and trying to figure some way around in the late 30s. Remember, there were a lot of ideas out there that never developed. Send the Jews to, to Rhodesia, to, to remember Acapulco, if you remember, uh, Sumner Wells, to Madagascar. In Madagascar. Well, that wasn't a real, that was a German plan. Um, uh, to, to, to Manchuria, there were a lot of, in other words, this is a family that was not at all distant from the Jewish problem. They were quite aware of what's happening in Jewish communities, except that they're not Jewish, that's all. Now, um, let's see. Uh, I might add that when the war was over, I don't have to tell, I think most people are aware, you know, Kenny had a brother who was killed in the war, and uh, it's all part of the uh, family myth, and, uh, and, and so forth, and you know, he, John F. Kennedy, ever had to step up to the plate and be the, what should I say, the fruition of his father's hopes, this is all basic to the story. I would just throw in that Bobby Kennedy uh, was a reporter, um, I think for the Herald Tribune, in Israel, in Palestine in 1948. Okay? And if you care to, you can Google, there's a, I saw a Wikipedia site called Bobby Kennedy in 48 in, 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 in Israel. So he, uh, there's a picture, I don't have him in front of the uh, King David Hotel, and he was kidnapped by the Haganah at one point because they thought he's a spy. Imagine if they shot him, oh my goodness. And, <laughs> and he saw the Arab site. I'll say it again. So it's now, you know, for two Americans who are not Jewish, they were quite, what shall I say, acquainted at first hand with the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli dispute and things along those lines, more than one would suspect. Now, John F. Kennedy, when he started, started running to fulfill his father's dream, and it's amazing, he did it in 14 years. He was a nobody, he ran for office in 46. He got in because the father bought the district, what else you knew? And that's what they did. They just walked around with, <laughs> with, with satchels with 20s in it. I mean, that's how you do it down there. And um, wait a second, there were no Jews in his district. He ran an Irish Catholic district in, uh, in, in, during the time he was in office. Later on, I'm told that that district was redistributed and a lot of Jews there. I don't know Boston very well, but by the time Tip O'Neill, who succeeded him, was congressman, it had already become like a Jewish neighborhood. 
You understand? So, but at the time John F. Kennedy was there, there was no juice over there whatsoever. He was almost dead. Look, you know, he was uh, recovering from the war wounds, and I told you he had a lot of illnesses out there. You can kind of see that. Um, but right away, after he won the first term, which was in 1901 and 46, and his first term was 47 and 48, just keep the years in mind, he was already planning to run for Senate in 52. You know, because you can't go nowhere for presidency, just a congressman. So he had to run for Senate. Once you run for Senate, it's a different vote. Because then it's Massachusetts statewide, and then you have different constituencies, and then you got Jews to deal with, correct? If you just stick with your own district, like we would say, for example, in Maryland, the Eastern Shore, or something like that, there's no Jews over there. But if you run a statewide, then you have to deal with a much. Now, it, let's think you're talking about Boston, all the communities around Boston. Some of you from Massachusetts know even better than I do. I, you know, I, I just know some of the names. Uh, that's a substantial population. Boston, for example, has a much larger Jewish population than Baltimore just off the top of my head. And a big Zionist one as well. Many of the leading Zionists in the Chaim Weizmann time were uh, from, from the Boston area. And so uh, he, Im- he re- immediately realized he has to cultivate uh, Jews. And uh, everybody knew at that time, in the late 40s, this is in Truman's time, the Jews are liberal, the Irish Catholics are conservative. That's how it goes. Okay? Here are the iconic figures from that time. Uh, Irish Catholic. <laughs> okay? Liberal Jew, Herbert Lehman, the, the senator from New York. By the way, Lehman had been the governor of New York in, in Roosevelt's time. He had been Franklin Roosevelt's deputy governor. And when Franklin Roosevelt became the president, he succeeded the governor, and he was a New Deal governor, and he won like five times, elected, re-elected, and all the rest of it, or New Deal platform. So here you have a classic case in the 30s, early 40s, of a guy running with the blacks, the Jews, the labor, uh, what's left, you know, the, the Irish vote, and so on, and so, the Italian vote, you know, the Catholic vote, and so on and so forth. The classic old-fashioned democratic New Deal kind of a coalition, and that's who Herbert Lehman was. Now, he, he lost in the war in 42, because in 42, people don't know this, in the Second World War, the country moved to the right. This is not very well known. The United States of America, a lot of people resented the war. Uh, we don't talk about this too much. They don't like the fact that their kids are going off to war and all the rest of it, and they saw the left as pushing the war. So there was a big push. The Democrats lost most of their majority in 42 and 44. That's how it goes. And if it hadn't been Roosevelt running the fourth time, the Republicans clearly would have won. The whole trend, uh, to give you an example I'm talking about, in 42, 43, and 44, the Congress wiped out all the New Deal programs. They defunded them. Okay? People don't know this unless you know your American history, but that's what happened. The Southern Democrats with the Western conservatives combined together to kill the New Deal. And uh, so Lehman was out. In 48... Um, this is just a good story. In '48, is that how it goes? Uh, Governor Dewey, who ran against Truman, the, the senator dropped dead. So he, Dewey appointed his friend, John Foster Dulles, as senator in the interim. Okay? So, um, so Dulles was for a few months a senator until they had an election, which was held in early '49. And this was the Times. And Dulles, therefore, is running for Senate in New York State. So Dulles is the Republican, and Lehman is the Democrat, and this is the McCarthy era. So, you know, let's put it this way. Dulles said like this, you want to vote for a, a left-wing liberal Democrat? You know, then he's a red. And any state that would sink him, but in New York, it's such a big Jewish and the other vote, so they said like this. He put up a sign, you want to vote for Adolf Hitler's lawyer? Because John Foster Dulles represented the Third Reich in the business deals in the 1930s. You know, so that, that killed Dulles. <laughs> so that was American politics at the time that John F. Kennedy is coming up. Right? You want to hit me, I'll hit you twice. That's how it goes. Now, um, Kennedy, as a congressman, visits Israel. Um, he went in 51 with a congressional delegation. But as you can sort of see over here, this is the main guy, and he's a nobody. Uh, this Ben-Gurion doing what he always did. He'd give a standard three-hour history to Jewish people. Uh, that, that, that really is what he did. Him and Begin were like, they just talked endlessly. Um, I hate people like that. The, um, <laughs> but the reason he's paying attention to this guy, this is Congressman Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Jr., right, who was a congressman from New York. Everybody thought the next president is going to be him, not this guy. If Ben-Gurion knew about this guy, he would kissed up to him. But Roosevelt's son, nobody knew that he would have a career that just would go nowhere. With that name, he should have gone to high places, and he never did. So it's just interesting that they didn't 
what should I say, cultivate the right person at that time. Um, I would even go so far as to point out that Kennedy, as a congressman from an all non-Jewish district, um, was involved in Cold War politics, and the State Department was against giving too much aid, this is under Truman, too much aid to Israel. Um, if you recall at all, the, the way I mentioned last year, Tr Truman used to take the <laughs> Truman used to take the the total package for the Middle East. Let's say it's fifty million dollars for the whole Middle East. He said like this: This should be fair, twenty-five to Israel, twenty-five to everybody else. You understand? Now that's not exactly fair. And if you're Kennedy, you're persuaded by actions in the State Department. He voted against Israel. Is what I'm trying to say. Right? He, to uh, slash the aid to Israel, and, and, and Israel lost thirty-three million dollars as a result of it. Not a cause of him only but a coalition of people like him. So he wasn't thinking at that time about his future. I don't know why he did it, or maybe he just he didn't like Israel, or maybe he thought the money was wasted. But hello, Dover who? Especially for a guy who the following year was going to run for uh, Congress. Um, whatever Israel got during that year, because eventually the, Israel was able to circumvent it. This is, there wasn't APAC at that time, but there was like APAC, you know, the, the Israeli lobby at that time, which really depended on a few congressmen doing all the work, the heavy lifting. Fortunately for Israel, the two, not John F. Kennedy, but the two other Massachusetts congressmen were very powerful, and they were very pro-Israel. The uh, John McCormick, who was the head of the Democrats, he later became the Speaker of the House, and Joe Martin, who was the head of the Republicans, who became the Speaker of the House. This is the guy that backed MacArthur against Truman. He invited General MacArthur to address Congress. You know, and Truman almost got impeached. And this is the guy who the opposite was the Ultra New Deal. So here, here are two distinctly non-Jewish congressmen who were super pro-Israel because they were from the old-fashioned politics. You understand? And Massachusetts has a lot of Jewish voters and they have friends and so on and so forth. So it wasn't thanks to Kennedy. I can say this, that when Kennedy runs the following year for um, Senate, uh, so he's going to have to, uh, which he did, I mean, let's take it, he runs against Henry Cabot Lodge, who was the senator at that time, and Henry Cabot Lodge was a famous name, you, you know that. And his father was the, was the senator, a very famous senator before him. He used to have a poem... Um, here's to old Massachusetts, the land of the bean and the cod, where the lodges talk only to cabots and cabots talk only to God. Right? <laughs> the best story, though, is in Woodrow Wilson's time, a Jewish guy named Schwartz or something like that, some Russian Jewish name, went to court and uh, went to court and he got he petitioned to get his name ch changed to Cabot, you know, <laughs> instead of Kabovsky or something like that. And the judge said, okay, and all hell broke loose because the Cabot family says, this is a Chil Hashem, you know, <laughs> and so forth. And Woodrow Wilson was the president at that time. He, he published a thing in the, in the paper. Here's the old Massachusetts, the land of the bean and the cod, where the lodges speak only to Cabots, and the Cabots speak Yiddish by God. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, as soon as he ran, started running for office, for Senate, all of a sudden he, he had a transformation. He, like Obama said, I rethink the whole, the whole thing, right? And his mother joined the Hadassah. I'm, I, I, I kid you not. You know, Rose Kennedy, she, and, she, and she and her daughter started making speeches for the Hadassah all over the state. Um, he got John McCormick to give a speech to all Jewish, he's, because he says, nobody will believe me. They brought all the rabbis and all the machers of the Jewish community in Boston together, and John McCormick got up there and lied his head off. He says, we were stuck on the, on the aid bill to Israel and we was going downhill. I knew there was one guy who could help us get us through, John F. Kennedy, you know, and so forth. So he made him into a pro-Israel guy. Uh, and that's what happened. So anyway, that, American politics what it is, is what it is. As senator, so Kennedy was a senator from 53 to 60. That's what he was, okay? From, 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 uh, from Massachusetts. I would say like this. He voted for Israel, but very unenthusiastically. He towed the APAC lines, he said, but you can tell the people, here are the guys that meant it. Johnson, Humphrey, people like that. Jackson, they were the ones who did the heavy lifting. Kennedy, like, you know, if they pass a, 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 a petition around, all right, I'll sign it, you know. If they say, we need your vote, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll vote there. You know what I'm saying? But he was not the type of person that you went to to, 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 to initiate anything. Um, in 50, so he has a very checkered record as far as Jews in Israel are concerned, is my point. In 56, Kennedy ran for vice president. I don't know if you know that, under Adlai Stevenson. He didn't win. It was lucky for Kennedy because Stevenson went down and um, got a nobody to be the, the vice president. After 
the Democratic defeat in 56. So in other words, 57, 58, 59, Kennedy focused like a laser on running for president next time. Even though he was a young guy, and no one would have thought he could do it. He was in his 30s when this began. And as you know, he was very young when he was elected. Um, and the son of a gun, he did it. So it's just a very interesting political story. And therefore, he already assembled a staff, and they start thinking about national issues and how do you touch bases. Now, I'm going to play for you something that's quite remarkable. And this is Senator John F. Kennedy gets, uh, gets an award at YU. Chief University in 57. Wait a minute. I'm sure some of the millionaires on YU's board were from Massachusetts, which is true. You see? And he mentions a few names over there. Um, no, but hear me out. I'm going to p- play uh, an extended piece, uh, seven or eight minutes, because it's a very thoughtful, it's online, a very thoughtful speech that Kennedy gives. I left a little bit in, a little bit out, about what's the role of minorities in expressing themselves on public policy, foreign policy, and Yeshiva University, which is a Jewish place. So in other words, he clearly knows he has to touch this base, but to do it in a, shall I say, an elegant way, and an intelligent way, and I think he did uh, quite a job. No, this, this is not a speech you would hear, as far as, in my opinion, as far as thoughtful is concerned, from a typical type of politician that we hear in the debates today. So here's John F. Kennedy responding to an award that was given him in Yeshiva University Banquet. Every man sent out from a university should be a man of his nation as well as a man of his time. There may be some who would question whether Yeshiva University has a significant role to play in this critical area of developing American leaders and mature public opinion. Their doubts may stem from the fact that Yeshiva is a Jewish university, founded and financed under Jewish auspices, and stressing stressing the Jewish history, culture, and religion in its academic offering. How then, some may ask, can Yeshiva, representing in this sense a minority interest and point of view, properly play a role in influencing American policies and American politics. I realize that this is a sensitive area for Jews and non-Jews alike. Particularly as one who is not of the Jewish faith, I am reluctant to trespass before this audience in an area in which your insight and experience is certainly greater than mine. But the problem is not limited to Jews, or for that matter to Catholics or the Irish or Negroes or any other ethnic group. The question of whether the national interest suffers from or is benefited by the relationship between our public policy and ethnic and religious groups is of concern to us all and deserves a discussion on that level. Even when the relationship between politicians and ethnic groups is characterized on both sides by restraint and responsibility, there are those who question the very existence of such a relationship. They question whether ethnic ties should play any role at all in our political life and our policy development. Among these critics are the Jews and non-Jews who are opposed, for example, to the Zionist activities of many large Jewish organizations. These critics have raised the question of what they call dual loyalty. The argument is not a new one. It has been leveled before at other minority groups. If it is valid, it applies with equal force to Irish Americans, to Polish Americans, to Italo Americans, and to others. Implicit in the charge of dual loyalty are the allegations, first, that an interest by Americans of the problems of the homeland is incompatible with loyalty to America, and second, that ties to other nations are necessarily harmful to American foreign policy. The first is the question of the incompatibility of loyalties. It seems to me that this argument is based on a closed concept of America. It is founded on the notion that loyalty to America means loyalty to one specific policy only, and that a plurality of loyalties is is incompatible with loyalty to one's country. But we know very well that loyalty to the political community is actually a product of loyalties to lesser associations. We know that democratic authority is grounded in consent, and we know that American freedom has its deepest tradition in the toleration of multiple group loyalties. A roll call of any infantry company during World War II revealed the extent to which America had successfully captured the loyalty of its ethnic and religious minority groups. A similar roll call of Americans who were responsible for the development of nuclear energy would further show the importance of winning allegiance by tolerating diversity. To say that interest in the welfare of the Irish in Ireland or the Hungarians in Hungary make Irish Americans or Hungarian Americans any less American 
is not only wrong, but it misses the main point. Our loyalty to America is not a mere allegiance to a piece of geography. We are loyal to a larger concept of American freedom, precisely because we are free to keep the old ways if we wish to do so. We can sing the old songs and speak the old languages and meet in fraternal groups whenever we choose. We can keep all of our old loyalties so long as they do not threaten the system of freedom it itself. This very freedom to be ourselves nurtures and sustains allegiance to America. It is not in any sense of the word disloyal. But let us look at the charge that other nation interests are incompatible with the demands of American foreign policy. Would you, don't you think that's an unusually intelligent speech? You know, uh, you, if you go and take the trouble, look it up. I think it, I think it'd be worthwhile to listen to the whole uh, thing and all that. As I say again, this is not something you hear from Obama or Donald Trump or any of these people. No, I, 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 no, he clearly is speaking to, to to the best and not to the worst. I share that with you to show the charisma. You see, you know, he had a lot of people vote against him, but a lot of people. Oh, he's a young guy. Yeah, but he's Epis got something. That's my point. Um, and it was at YU of all places. Okay. Now, uh, actually, if you know Dr. Belkin, he probably would have preferred a check from Kennedy than a speech, but okay. The, uh, can I tell you this story? My favorite story, Dr. Belkin, who was the president of YU, he was together once in the 60s with Cardinal Spellman, and uh, what he called Spellman was for ecumenical purposes, he wrote a check for $5,000 from the Catholic Charities for YU. And it made, well, you know, ecumenical. And uh, it was a press conference, and he made a whole big deal out of it. And they're speaking about brotherly love and so forth. And Cardinal Spellman said, I guess, look, you have a skull cap, I have a skull cap, we're all brothers in the same religion. And Belkin said, like this, there's a difference. You've got a red skull cap, but you represent an institution that's in the black. <laughs> <laughs> I, on the other hand, have a black skull cap, but I really, you know. <laughs> Has anything changed in 50 years? Okay, uh, by 1960, John F. Kennedy's a clear liberal at a time when this was not a dirty word. And Jews will overlook the pop, mainly because they didn't like Nixon. That's the bottom line. I don't say this is grounded in anything, not grounded. That, that, I'm, I'm going back to the way people felt, okay? Uh, the only Jew that I know voted for Nixon in 1960 was Rabbi Hertzberg because he couldn't stand the pop. Now, um, at the level of Jewish mass feeling, Eisenhower and Nixon are not friendly to Israel. I don't say that's true. I don't say it's not that we've discussed it at great length. I'm talking about the way people felt in the shoals, <laughs> you know, and the country club. The Nixon, they're anti-Semitic. It's got nothing to do with the truth. This is government voting. And as a result, Kennedy got 83%. Because, and the father was shocked. Look what he said. In his inimitable way. What am I supposed to do with this, right? <laughs> um, and I might point out, in addition to the... No, it's, 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 so you'll see in a minute, it was a close call, and the Jewish vote actually mattered a great deal. That's number one. And number two, money-wise, here's, here's Kennedy with uh, Abe Feinberg. <laughs> it's as simple as that. They, they, you know, he raised very substantial contributions. Now, I don't know why they didn't make Kennedy pay himself, but that's the way it goes. There are idiots out there that actually send money to Trump, you know, for president. I mean, I, I don't get that. A guy will send ten dollars. They used to send for Forbes. You know, uh, it, it defines imagination. But anyway, uh, the 1960 election was a close call. Look at this. Uh, look at the numbers. Kennedy, Nixon, 34 million, 34 million, 34 million, 220, 30 million, 108. Okay. So the Jewish vote of a million, or whatever, in New York. Big, important, let alone in the electoral college business. As you see, Kennedy, look at, these are all the red states or Nixon. Kennedy did not win some gigantic uh, landslide or anything, quite the contrary. And believe me, he wouldn't have carried the southern state without Johnson, which is, which is why he took Lyndon Johnson on there. As you see, the Republicans had already started to make inroads in, um, in the south, and that was coming in the future. Um, this, Kennedy, I'll, just to tell you something, when he was a senator, was very quiet on civil rights. Never made a speech about civil rights. That's because he was planning to run for president. Didn't want to take off the South. Just, this, this is how politics works in those days. Now, once he got elected, 
he wanted to name as Secretary of State Fulbright, <laughs> Senator Fulbright, Israel's number one enemy. Okay? J. William Fry, Senator from Arkansas, Chairman of Foreign Relations Committee, uh, the, the founder of the Fulbright Scholarships, if anybody here has one or had one, um, and the number one opponent of American support for Israel. Uh, that's pretty bad. Now, uh, what happened was that the Jewish groups protested, but Kennedy didn't care. But then the civil rights groups protested because Fulbright had signed the segregation uh, declarations because he's from Arkansas, he wanted to get elected. So between that, see, since he alienated the blacks and the Jews, so Kennedy couldn't pick him. Whereupon Joe Kennedy said, I guess anybody that's opposed by black and Jews is my kind of guy. And he sent him three big cases of scotch <laughs> for free. Okay? Now, um, so in the end, Kennedy ended up picking Dean Rusk, who would be Secretary of State for eight years, one of the longer ones. Okay? Dean Rusk had been the uh, number two under Atchison and Marshall. So he was in the State Department in 48 that tried to block Truman. Truman overrode them, of course. So, the, you know, I'm just telling you, this is, this is who uh, Rusk was. He pointed Robert McNamara, if anybody remembers, these are from our old days, as Secretary of Defense, and McNamara will end up being pro-Israel. It's interesting. Uh, he appointed William Bundy, who was Atchison's son-in-law, to be um, the head of the Defense Department's foreign policy. Uh, uh, staff, if you know what that is. Defense Department has its own little foreign policy operation. And, and William Bundy will again be uh, surprisingly pro-Israel, as we'll see. And so, it's a funny mix of group that he put, it put in there. He also picked jo- McGeorge Bundy, I meant to say, as his national security advisor. The reason I'm emphasizing this is under Kennedy, the, the State Department will be downgraded. And this is important for Israel, because the State Department was still staffed with Arabists and professional diplomats of the type that uh, didn't like Israel at all. And um, believe me, Kennedy was strongly criticized for the fact that he ran a sloppy foreign policy, Atchison, for example, uh, and, and they said this is not the way it's done. Under Truman and under Eisenhower, the State Department was the main place for making policy and executing policy, not under Kennedy. If you don't like what the State Department said, you went to the White House and talked to somebody. And that's uh, you know bad staffing policy, is that right? Because if you put people in charge of something, you don't allow a system where they can go in, o- over you. Or around you. But that's how Kennedy ran the show. This is famous, and I remember when I was young, they used to write uh, books about his particular style of uh, management, which wasn't so great. And of course, he appointed Mike Feldman, Mayor Feldman, from his staff to be, have a special office in the White House to be in charge of Jewish stuff. Okay? And so if you don't like the way the State Department is doing something, call Feldman, and Feldman can call me. And that was his way of fulfilling his, as he saw it, fulfilling his obligation to Feinberg and all those other guys. He said, I'm not going to let you run foreign policy. It's my job. But I'm always willing to, to, to give you a special ear. You understand those of you want? I'll listen to what you say. Okay, so that's just interesting. If you're a leader around the country for any reason and you want to call the White House, there is a number you can call and you will get an answer back from Feldman. And if it's Kadai, he'll take it up. Okay, he will, will, will listen on there. So that's how Kennedy ran the show. The three big issues during his administration, we all know, is shot. So he was there for 61, 62, and 63. He was killed in November of 63, of course. Uh, three big issues were Demona, the Hawk missiles, and the Arab refugees. Now, we talked about Demona already, right? And the A-bomb and everything uh, connected with that. But uh, that leaves the other matters, which were big. Like President Obama, I find many parallels between Kennedy and Obama. It's interesting. Particularly in the area of foreign policy. Uh, that's what I'm referring to, foreign policy. And particularly in the area of the Middle East. But not only in the Middle East. Like Obama... Kennedy was convinced he could seduce Nasser, okay? And he kisses up to him a lot. So one of the things Kennedy did when he became president was he started writing a whole long series of correspondence with Nasser uh, full of uh, praise and flattery and respect because he figured, as Obama did when he became president and he made a speech in Cairo to say that we respect the Islamic religion, we respect the Arab peoples. He, he uses the word respect a lot with Iran and so forth. This is based on the idea that the reason they don't like us is because they feel that we haven't given them respect. And, so he wanted to, and there's, there is some truth to that. The right? question is how much, but there is some truth to that. And so um, he and Nasser did establish a relationship with people that didn't meet. And his idea was to win him over. Um, lots of money. An unprecedented amount of foreign aid was sent to uh, Egypt during Kennedy's time. Uh, lots of compliments. If you read the... Uh, you can see from the speech I, I just had before you that Kennedy was a very intelligent communicator. Would you agree with that? And so his letters to foreign leaders and to Nasser are, are, are like that. 
Um, Israel, of course, freaked out, <laughs> right? Because, no, it's always the way it is in the American-Israel relationship. You, you, you like another girl, you don't like me. I don't like you talking to other girls. You understand? Like, what are you, what, what, what are you doing over there? And they said, no, it's nothing bad, you know. But and it's, it's, it, 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 they don't like it over there. They're, they're worried. The State Department and Kennedy's National Security Council Middle East guy really pushed the Nasser thing. I mean, they pushed it a lot. The, interestingly, this guy... You know, these are the faceless bureaucrats who make all the decisions. Robert Cummer was a big macher under Kennedy and Johnson. He was Jewish from St. Louis, from a super reform, anti-Zionist, non-Zionist family, that kind of background. Uh, you know, his, his parents had a, a business in St. Louis. He went to Harvard. He was interested in doing the uh, family auto business, so he did, you know, the international relations and that sort of thing. And it became a big deal under Kennedy and Johnson. It became a big, big deal in the Vietnam War, if anybody remembers that. Blow tour Bob, they call him. And, uh, yeah, he was a tough guy. And he was the point man during Kennedy's time for dealing with the Middle East and dealing with Israel. And they said, Nasser is the key to everything. The Russians have kissed up to him. We've got to out-kiss him. That's what it is. We've got to win him over to our side because Nasser seemed to be so charismatic and he was leader of the uh, neutralist movement and his pictures were all over the bazaars, as I told you already, throughout the Middle East. And he certainly had a certain charisma. And if we can win him over for America, then uh, that'll be great. Now, that's, to be perfectly frank, it's very patronizing, condescending. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's patronizing, condescending. It says, and if I offer you a few things, then you'll be on my side. So, in other words, that's not like I like you. I'm manipula- manipulating you. That is what countries do. But let's be clear about this. Now, what happened? Uh, as he's saying, Yiddish Nasser blabbed the Nasser. And he, he, you know, the leper couldn't change his spots. And so, in spite of what, everything he said, Nasser and Khrushchev increased their cooperation relations during Kennedy's administration, which drove Kennedy crazy. Because, you know, I sent you flowers. I sent you chocolates. How come you're, how come you're going out with the other girl? You know, I, I thought we were a thing, you know? And uh, this is how it was played. This reached its fruition in Yemen in 1962, okay? Here is uh, the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, the Arabian Peninsula, I should say. Here's the part of Arabian Peninsula called Saudi Arabia. Here's Egypt, as you can see in Israel up here. So Egypt is not far from what I'm talking about, right? So right across the Red Sea from Saudi Arabia. And down here is Yemen. And Yemen used to be ruled by an imam. In other words, like today we would call it ISIS. That's exactly what he was. They didn't have to go back to the Middle Ages. They were still holding the Middle Ages. And it was... Oh, and it was and was overthrown by Nasser uh, young officers who wanted to bring in a secular Nasserist type of state. Uh, they uh, you know, brought in modern weapons and things like this, and the imam and these guys fought them, and it looked like the imam type guys are going to win because you and I know today with our hindsight living in 2015 that those countries are really full of fundamentalist fanatics, agree? And so Nasser in order to back his guys, because he approved of this, um, this is something I'll talk about more in the future in, the, in this uh, lecture series, uh, he, st- he sent soldiers just like America did to Vietnam. In fact, he said, this is my Vietnam. First he sent a battalion, then he sent a division, then he sent two, then he sent three. He even used poison gas on them. Okay, this was famous at that time. Uh, uh, he, the, the, what was it, the CIA, so he's using a gas of Egyptian origin, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, so he invaded over there. The State Department tried to tell Kennedy, keep kissing up to him, cultivate his uh, friendship, uh, overlook this or something like that. Kennedy was fuming. Uh, this was a big threat to Saudi Arabia. Look at this. He can attack Saudi Arabia from here and from here. Do you understand from two ends? You don't know your history. In the 1800s, in the early 1800s, uh, Egypt successfully invaded and conquered Saudi Arabia. That's because in the early 1800s, the Wahhabis, that's what the Saudi Arabians are, had taken over Saudi Arabia and killed a lot of people, and the Ottoman Turks didn't like this. And so what the Ottoman Turks did was they franchised. They said to the Pasha of Egypt, Mehmed Ali, says, well, you, you get an Egyptian army and go in there and kill these guys. And he did do it. So as an Egyptian army landed in the 1800s crossing the Red Sea, conquered Mecca, Medina, and all that business, uh, killed whoever they were supposed to kill, and then left. So... In so- to me, that's just an interesting factoid. Uh, to you, you didn't even know it existed. In Arabia, they learned it in the schools. You know what I'm saying? So the Arabians are afraid that, this, that, that Nasser is going to try to take out Saudi Arabia, which he wanted to. And so they're freaking out. So let's put it this way. Ben-Gurion's going crazy. 
And he said to, to Kennedy, he said, I told you this would happen when you try to get together with a dictator like Nasser, who's bloodthirsty, and you can't trust his word and all the rest of it. Uh, Nasser started having border incidents with Saudi Arabia and bombing area in Saudi Arabia, which of course freaks out the Saudi royal family. Uh, they got rid of the old king Saud and put this guy in because he was much more capable. And in the years I'm talking about, they were so scared of the Nasser threat up to the Six Day War when everything changed. But there was Nasser threat that they weren't even talking about Israel. That's how bad it was. Even though King Faisal was a son of a gun, and he, he's the, uh, the founder of all this Islamic uh, extremism, he's the founder of it and the, and the bankroller of it. He's the one who started the whole thing. Yes. And, um, and there's still a lot of the ISIS won the last a day without Saudi Arabia. You hear what I said? All this trouble you have, the ISIS won't last a day without Saudi Arabia. So we, you know, the, 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 the news leads you off the track unless you care to look. And um, they were so worried about Nasser that uh, you know, they weren't talking about Israel. In fact, I'll show you later on the Mossad and the Saudis were actually cooperating. Um, so uh, let's see now. Uh, Nasser has a policy that has united against them the Israel lobby, the Saudis, and not only them, but big oil because they have holdings in Saudi Arabia. And they want to quiet. And so the Kennedy administration now found themselves in a strange situation. Two delegations are showing up at the same time, the Jews and big oil, <laughs> against the pro Nasser. That doesn't happen. You know, that usually big oil is against, is against Israel. So Nasser's policy had united two natural flows against them. The Mossad and the CIA discover that the USSR is sending missiles to Nasser. Okay? Um, and it was true. The, the deal had been cut. Ben-Gurion basically said to Kennedy, what does it take? We need defensive missiles against their missiles. What, are we supposed to be here naked or something like that? Because Ben-Gurion had been pushing already since Eisenhower's time, the American needs defensive American weapons, defensive American weapons. They were like a broken record. That's who Ben-Gurion was. He was a broken record. I was his kayak and, and it also drove him crazy. And uh, Kennedy started to waver. Because all during 1961, the State Department said, don't do this, don't do this. Anytime you send arms... Israel just took off the Arabs and make things worse. In other words, they had the Eisenhower policy, which I tried to explain last year was not a dumb policy. To be perfectly honest, it was not a dumb policy. As long as everything stays at a lower level of simmering, it doesn't blow up to something hot. Israel had nothing to gain from a war. That was the general view of the U.S. government. Now, I don't disagree with that. You know, there's a certain way of looking at it. But I say that with hindsight standing here, you know... Uh, <laughs> not having to make these decisions. At that time, they didn't notice they were going crazy. And Ben-Gurion saw that um, Kennedy was wavering, let's put it this way, and so he sent Paris. Right? That was his secret weapon. He sent Paris, who was Mr. Amazing and during those years. Again, I'll have more about him to say later in this uh, series, I hope. And uh, Paris comes to Washington. He meets with the State Department, and he sees he can't get anywhere with them, just like he couldn't get anywhere with the foreign ministry in Paris. And he couldn't get anywhere with the foreign office in England, and so on and so forth. So Paris, as, as you perhaps followed in what we talked about last year, Shimon Paris became an expert in going around them. And so what happens is uh, he, does, he circumvents the foreign ministry, circumvents the State Department, and he goes to see this guy. Okay, Why be the Attorney General? Well, I guess as a brother. <laughs> you understand? And... Uh, Basically, Bobby Kennedy says, how are you going to get, it, get, get, it, get it into the White House? And Paris said, you're going to help me. <laughs> you know. And uh, next thing you know, Mike Feldman invites Paris to the White House, to the basement office, because that's where he had his own. And Feldman arranges, the, and, and, he, and they have a whole conversation about the weapons and all that sort of thing. And, we, and Paris keeps saying, we need the Hawk missiles, the Hawk missiles. That was these defensive missiles they used at that time. And uh, Mike Feldman says, I guess, follow me around. They walk around the White House, and they bump into Kennedy, quote-unquote bump. Bump into J.F. Kennedy, and uh, Kennedy says, oh, Paris is here, come into the Oval Office. And here, Paris makes his famous pitch. He says, I'm here because we are doves who are looking for hawks. <laughs> you know, he loves that kind of, uh, you know, uh, one-liners and so forth. As I said before, the Mossad and the CIA found out that Nasser was going to get missiles from Khrushchev. And uh, here, here were the missiles, you'll see in a second, that they showed off. Because if, if those of us are old enough to remember, every May Day, they show off the brand new missiles. You know, in America, they show off the new automobiles, right? <laughs> and in Russia, after the parades, they came the, the May Day. There you go. He said, this is this what, what, what he's giving Israel. Solid fuel, by the way. You know, all the latest stuff. And Israel is tremendously vulnerable. And he made a whole spiel for Kennedy. And it wasn't a false 
You understand what I'm saying? No, this was a reality, and so we really, we really need this. I might also add that 1962 was an election year, Congress elections, which played no small part of that. Kennedy was worried because in 61, Adlai Stevenson voted against Israel on these incidents with Syria. One of the things that happens under Kennedy, which I'll talk about later, is that the border with Syria heated up. To be perfectly honest, as much Israel's fault as anybody else. And um, uh, Stevenson said at that time, he said, we can't have any more of these retaliatory raids. This, this is uh, something the, the United States doesn't want to tolerate. Notice it's not back to the early 50s in which you could, you know, most of the day could leave people and blow up an Arab village anymore. That's gone. And so that ticked off the Jewish voters. So I'm just trying to bring you back for a moment in American and Jewish history over there uh, and to say that, you know, disproportionate retaliation is out of fashion by now. But on the other hand, this is still the age of Exodus. It's Paul Newman movie come out this year. It's all that stuff. It was a different America. It's not the America of today. Okay? I say sadly. Uh, it was a different America. Israel was high in the culture. I might even say Jews were high in the culture in the time I'm talking about. It's never absent total anti-Semitism, but really was marginalized in the early 60s. Um, and so, to kiss up to the Jewish vote, Kenny is, is thinking that, you know, he's going to have to go and, and okay the hawk sales of those, mis- of those missiles to Israel, which will break a taboo. Something that Truman and Eisenhower never agreed to do was sell um, significant weapons to Israel. Now, Eisenhower, um, and by the way, I mean, you have to understand, every time Ben-Gurion came to Washington during the Eisenhower time, he was trying to do like a kid does with a teacher in high school, says, I'm getting an A, I'm getting an A, I'm getting an A. Are we getting the weapons? Are we getting the weapons? And if anybody ever says, maybe. So you said we're getting a weapon. You promised. You know, that, that's the Ben-Gurion. In, in 1960, was it 59? Ben-Gurion came, 60, uh, came, came to Washington, and he spoke to everybody. It was a new Secretary of State because Dulles had died, so it was Christian Herter. And, and he was just trying to be polite. And he says, well, we'll, we'll give your request serious consideration. Herder said he's going to give a serious consideration. He went to, 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 to Eisenhower and said, it's a serious consideration. So it means yes. It means yes. And Eisenhower had to tell him, no. And oh, no, no, no. We're not giving nothing. Like that. But Herder promised. Herder promised. Herder. No, no. That's who Ben Green was. You understand? And even when he said, no, no, no. He said, all right. If you say no. But Herder promised. <laughs> you understand? Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is you couldn't do this with Eisenhower, but he could do it with Kennedy. Kennedy was a different guy. He was young and he was very polite. It's interesting. And he wasn't, you know, the type of guy like Eisenhower who says, read my lips. No. Okay? I know what you need. I know what you know. And you don't need this. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, so it was a new day. And Ben-Gurion was therefore ecstatic. Israel was ecstatic when, in 62 when it was finally announced, uh, reluctantly with the State Department acquiescence, that they're actually going to sell missiles to Israel because this broke the taboo. They didn't go like later under Nixon and give him everything, but, it, but it's the beginning, all right, of what you and I know today is the most important uh, factor in Israeli history, which is the American arms. We, we cannot deny this, okay? This is what's uh, t- tilted in Israel's favor ever since then, because God forbid if they should be that the other side has better weapons than in one last two minutes. And so this is, this is the way it went over there. Now, ironically, the Russian missiles never got to Nasser, because this happened in 62, a month after this decision comes the Cuban crisis. At that time, they thought America was going to invade Cuba. So they diverted the missiles and sent them to Castro. Okay? So Israel got the weapons, and, and Nasser didn't. Uh, life is strange that way. One of the most significant aspects of all this was that the Pentagon, for the first time in history, sided with Israel. And this is very important. For the next 25 years or so, the Pentagon will be a pro-Israel factor until Weinberger. You understand? It's interesting. Uh, McNamara, you wouldn't think that, uh, of being that type. William Bundy was a wasp gadol. Right? He, was a, he was the son-in-law of Dean Acheson. I mean, give me a break. Uh, you know, the brother of George Bundy. Did nothing Jewish in the background. But they, at that time, it was in the culture, it was in the air, like I say, the Paul Newman movies and all that sort of thing. And people felt Israel is an a, is a, uh, underdog and that their life is threatened and that there shouldn't be another... They wouldn't use these words, but there shouldn't be another Holocaust. It was a, this was in the atmosphere of the culture of America. I can't emphasize too much to audiences how much a large role culture plays in, 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 in actions. We think that we operate on logical arguments, but logical arguments are all located within a, a parameters of culture. You understand? There are certain things that you just can't do and can't say, even though you can. And there are certain ways of thinking beyond which, in a particular cultural context, people are not going to go. It's, it's really fascinating. And the time I'm talking about, Israel was in, in the movies, in the plays, in the thinking of the politicians, and, and, and all the rest of it. Now, um, 
Having okayed the Hawk missiles, Kennedy as an administration tries to tie it to what he called the Johnson Plan. Here we come across a tricky business that I'm going to speak at greater length next week. And I'm talking about the Arab refugees. Kennedy came into office um, surrounded by what we would call Brookings Institution type people and uh, thoughtful foreign policy analysts. And it is a fact, what are you going to do with the Palestinian refugees? Where's it going? They're all in refugee camps. Now, I know today we look back and we say, well, it was under Jordan. But nevertheless, um, they were just breeding more. Uh, the UN looked as an open expense. And it is the core of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Israel uh, has never attempted to try to deal with this problem. I would even go so far as to say that Israel's entire foreign policy since 1948 has been to, to try to avoid dealing with this problem. Uh, that's quite a statement. Uh, they always talk about something else. We want direct negotiations, we want this, we want that, down, down till today, in the hope that it'll go away somehow. Now, a doctor will tell you a lot of times the thing does go away, true? But sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes things really do change. I'll just give you one example off the top of my head. Talk about the Soviet Jewry. Who figured that Russia would go down the tubes and Gorbachev and then a million Jews would go to Israel? So if you're willing to wait for 40, 42 years, maybe. But some things don't go away. Some things do not go away. And here we have a big problem. And uh, uh, Joseph Johnson of the Carnegie Foundation was picked by Kennedy, Joseph Johnson, to go into the Middle East and try to come up with some, what do you call, solution to the problem, which consisted of saying like this, Okay, let's divide. A, a chalik of the refugees go back to Israel and everybody else will be absorbed by the Arab states. This was the essence of the uh, plan. Okay? And Kennedy backed it very strongly. Even Mike Feldman did. Now, why did they do that? Uh, Kennedy didn't hate Israel, so why did he do that? It was an attempt to head off what eventually did happen, which was the formation of the PLO, which I'll talk about next week. Uh, this happened because there was no solution being presented by anybody for the Palestinian problem. Finally, the the Arabs and the Palestinians said, the heck with it, we'll do our own, own thing. This is still in the last years, Kennedy's the last years before the Palestinians took responsibility for themselves, and when their fate was in the hands of larger state actors. In that context, the idea was like this, let's make it go away, settle the thing, uh, work out some plan, and then once that's done, it was felt, the most important poison or irritant in the Arab-Israeli conflict will be removed, and it will then be possible to negotiate some kind of... No, the Arabs will settle and make peace with Israel. This was the hope, okay? Now, uh, uh, the opponents disliked it for that very reason. They don't want this to be solved, because why should they? They figured time's on their hands, and eventually to wipe out Israel. And so when this was presented by Kennedy, now he was very careful about this. He, taught, he sent letters to Nasser before it was announced, and so when Nasser said, I guess, well, you know, let's see. The essence of the plan was they were doing a questionnaire. They were going to ask all the, it was based on a wishful thinking, which was a lie. And the wishful thinking is a lot of these people aren't going to want to go back anyway. And so if you give them, as Kennedy said, at maybe one in ten, if you give them a choice, most of them will elect to move to an Arab country anyway. Why would they want to move back to Israel, especially when they don't they can't move to their own home or something like that? And if 100,000, uh, and Ben Gurion said if it's 100,000, he's willing to take it, but not more. So, but this is a lot. I was, always, I was always surprised to hear that. They were in Golden Mayor. If it's 100,000 or something like that, then we'll do it. And the essence of the plan was, he said, no, you have to give them a choice. I'm telling you, I am guarantee you that only one in ten will choose it. This is exactly what the PLO says today. I don't know if you follow the news closely, but Abu Mazen and Saeed Abu Ekrat and all these guys, they say Israel should agree in principle to take back all the refugees. You'll see nobody will take it up. A very small proportion, that's a big lie. Because what they really want to do is, you signed, and now you've got to live with it. You get it? It's a big lie. I hate to say it, but a lot of Israeli politicians are dumb, and sooner or later there's going to be a government that's going to, going to take that, the next government or something like that. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm afraid I'm right. So Ben-Gurion and Golda were very skeptical. Theoretically, they would take the deal, as they said, with 100,000, and you settle it once and for all. Um, but this was not realistic. Why should the Arabs have And so the founders of Israel this points out, had no plan for the Arab refugees. Um, every prime minister, uh, Ben-Gurion, Moshe Sharet, 
uh, Eshko, Golda Meir, and the others. I mean, what, what, what do you do with the refugees? They should be absorbed by the Arab countries, but they don't want to be absorbed by the Arab countries. Well, let's talk about breakfast, you know. Now, uh, this, this is a problem. Now, Kennedy was no fool, and he said, listen, it's not going to go, not going to go but let's give it a try. Uh, <laughs> the, the, this guy, Parker Hart, was the head of the Arabists in the State Department, who was ambassador to Saudi Arabia. And he said to Kennedy, he said, you know, it's terrible. I'm always being pressured by all these Jewish groups. The Arabs never pressure me. And Kennedy said, Parker, they don't need to pressure you. You're on their side. That's why they never, that's why they never push you. <laughs> you understand? So he knew which way it's going. And as I say, it was an idea out there. Nasser and the others toy with the idea, but they ultimately rejected because they want Israel to accept all the refugees, in which case Ben-Gurion said, to hell with that. And so it went nowhere. Kennedy did not drop this. And he was planning to bring it up in the second term. And just like Obama was thinking like this. He said, you know, I'll get reelected. And then we're going to pressure Israel for its own good. Um, but I don't think he wanted to take a make all back. He probably persuaded himself, not 100,000, make a quarter million, but then the others will go away. He would have run into the reality that the others all want, everybody wants to go back. And it's an intractable problem. And, it's, and, and you know, I'm just laying out for what it is. It's, 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 it's still on the table today, uh, 60 years later. Now, uh, this goes to show you that... Uh, Kennedy's basic approach was as follows. As long as we engage with the Arabs, as long as we are not ostentatious in a hugging Israel, we will create a non-war climate in the Middle East. I don't disagree with this, but that means he had the same... That was, that was Eisenhower. <laughs> it's the same thing. Israel's there. It's kind of obvious that we're not letting them go down the tubes. We don't have to publicly say this. We don't have to bring anybody to the White House and have the Israeli flag. You know, you know it's going to take them off. You know, it's enough that you're there. Listen, new immigrants are coming in every year. In these years, it was tens of thousands of immigrants coming in. Israel, during these years, was having an economic boom. They were. It was a high degree of uh, economic growth rate in the early 60s. Uh, Israel was improving its weapons from buying from Europe. What do you want? Just shut up. You get what I'm saying? Like, what, what, what do you need those for? But Israel, for perfectly understandable reasons, say like this, why are you always going out with that girl? You never sent me, why, don't we, why are we never seen in public? <laughs> that, 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 that's what it was. This means that you're uh, dumping us. Next thing I know, I'm going to get a phone call, goodbye. We're going to cut off the money and all the rest of it. So this is the reality that Kennedy uh, faced with all the time. They were always afraid, the Israelis, that the Arabs, the State Department types, would dominate the administration, seduce them away to Israel, to which they now think of so committed this filtered down to Abe Feinberg, who was calling Kennedy. Are you abandoning us? And no, I'm not abandoning you, and all, all that sort of thing. And uh, after playing around, therefore Kennedy had to, for political purposes and for strategic purposes, after playing around with the Arabs, all, every once in a while, he had to get together and kiss the Israelis in public. And so here's a famous little uh, thing where in late 62, he gets together with Golda Meir, who was the foreign minister at that time, at the home of a millionaire in, in Miami Beach. Okay. They made nice with her. It's a, by the way, it's not in the White House. Get it? It's not an official meeting. Right? It's at a friend's house. And he writes to Nasser. He said, we didn't have no official meeting. We didn't do nothing, you know. It's just a, a little business. You know, I love you more. <laughs> okay? That's Mike Feldman in the middle. So you get the idea. And, and he, by the way, said some quite remarkable things. I'm going to have it up, up in a little while where he said, listen, everybody knows that Israel and America have a special relationship. The only other country we have a relationship with like this was England. That's what he said, with Britain, which is quite a statement. But we don't need, but you know, Golden and I guess, okay, let's have a defense treaty. <laughs> you know, have some tanks, have some planes. No, we don't want to go to... Uh, Kennedy was trying to push through a deal in the second term. Then he wouldn't have to worry about the re-election. Um, I might add, and keep this in mind, every president has been committed to solving the refugee problem. Every president. Uh, you know, uh, Kennedy and Johnson and uh, Nixon and uh, Ford and Carter and all the rest down to Obama. Uh, they always run into this brick wall. Okay? Because solving the refugee problems means wiping out Israel. That's what, plain and simple as that. And, you know, and, and, and how do you get around that? So they want to solve them. And now, in the dream world, in the ideal world, somebody will figure out a way to, to persuade all the Arabs to go to Pakistan. But short of that, although Palestinians, short of that, 
you know, how are you going to solve this problem? Obama is majorly committed, believe me, as a human being, as a liberal, as an American, he's majorly committed to cleaning out the refugee camps, disassembling them, having everybody settle in some place and all the rest of it. And the Obama administration, like the Kennedy administration, is always putting a lot of pressure on Israel. Bibi's not the guy, but, 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 but pressure on Israel that they should agree to take in a substantial number of refugees. Not more than Israel can handle. And, 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 and the other side, the Abu Mazen and others, are always saying, take them in. Does that mean that that settles the problem? No, we never said that, but take these guys in. And we know what's happening, you see. So it's kind of strange to look at the history from a half century ago and see that nothing has, has changed in all this. Um, because Israel knows this, and because the Palestinian population is always growing, every big Israeli leader, or many of them, I should say, has had a dream that somehow or other they will be able to solve the Palestinian refugee problem. This is a lodestar, a big area in the Israeli plan. Rabin and Paris deceived themselves at Oslo that Arafat would solve it for them. They didn't negotiate so well. They thought that they had gotten a commitment from Arafat that once they set up a Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, they'll take in all the refugees. It turned out that once they got this, then Arafat said, no, that's not what we meant. Uh, Bougie Herzog thinks that Abu Mazen will do it for him. There's a meeting with him. They used to think years ago that King Hussein would do it for him. That's why Reagan and Schultz, who were very pro-Israel, very pro-Israel, uh, used to meet all the time with Hussein. Figure maybe Jordan will, will, will do it. Uh, what can I tell you? It's it's the you know the Holy Grail, but it's also going nowhere. Now uh, Kennedy's initiative did retard the issue for a few years. Meaning, I'm saying this in praise of Kennedy that because he engaged with the Arabs, because he constantly sent out messages, I respect you, I'm interested in what you have to say, and so on and so forth, they might not have liked the fact that they thought he's too much close with Nasser, and they thought that's just stupid on the part of Kennedy, the same way that all these administrations in the Middle East think that Obama's stupid for being friends with the Muslim Brotherhood, or with Iran, or for the other thing. You know, these, this kind of issue goes on. Saudi Arabia was furious at Kennedy for kissing up to Nasser. Saudi Arabia is furious at Obama for kissing up to whoever, you know, uh, the, the, the Shiites. The, you know, this is part of how it goes. But when we're engaged and we're talking and we're negotiating all the rest of it, so meanwhile, we're dancing and you can't do war while we're dancing. And this more or less was the Kennedy policy. It had been the Eisenhower policy as well. The reason I mention it is because it's going to be different under LBJ, okay, which is food for thought. When he died, when Kennedy died, Johnson would not pursue this policy with any energy. America was formally, com form formally committed to engaging with the Arabs, formally committed to discussing everything and all the rest of it, even with Nasser. But you could tell Johnson didn't mean it. <laughs> He's in the other side's boat. Do you get it? And so uh, the issue festered and turned toxic and eventually led to the Six-Day War. That's how it happened. Most analysts would say, if Kennedy had been president, you know, hadn't gotten shot and won a second term, the Six-Day War would never happen. Because he was too close with Nasser all the rest of that day, that it wouldn't have allowed a situation where nobody was in charge and then move led to counter-move, as you and I know, and that led to another counter-move, and next thing you know, they're, they're shooting at each other. Um, that's a very interesting observation. Now, uh, in summation, I would say that uh, Kennedy, as I say, reminds me of Aaron Joe Obama. Look what he said to Golda Meir here. It's quite interesting. The U.S. has a special relationship with Israel and the Middle East, really comparable only to what we have with Britain over a wide range of world affairs. But to us, to, for us to play properly the role we're called upon to play, we cannot afford the luxury of identifying Israel and Pakistan and any other countries as our exclusive friends. Right? The minute I'm too much in one corner, I'm not doing you a favor. It's a very intelligent remark. Okay? Ewing to the line of close intimate allies. For we feel about Israel, even though it's not a formal ally, and letting other countries go. If we pull out of the Arab Middle East and maintain our ties only with Israel, this would not be in Israel's interest. Isn't that interesting? And you hear the words, even though it makes all nervous. Because if, because if you dance with the other girl, you, you're going to leave with her and not with me. And this is what they're afraid of. Okay? So there's a lot of emotionalism, and not just pure, what's the right, intellectual diplomatic framework operating over here. And that's because the world is what it is. Now, um, th this had happened. Kennedy, of course, left the scene in November of 63, and uh, Johnson became president. By the time Johnson became president, it was Ben-Gurion was out. He had left in June of 63 under Kennedy, and it was Eshkol. Um, so the Israeli-American relationship 
in six, it was left of 63, 64, 65, and 66, had to be between Lyndon Johnson and, and Levi Eshkol. Um, during Kennedy's time, it's very interesting, I told you, um, well, actually, I didn't tell you this. The IDF, the Israeli army, was seriously beefing up its power and weapons. It's a very interesting era, if you're a military historian, in the history of the Israeli army. Uh, Rabin had been named chief of staff. Um, before him was Tzvi Tzur for a couple of years. They really concentrated on turning the Israeli army into something for the 1960s instead of something from the 1940s, which is what it was. Uh, they didn't once got real tanks. They got real planes. And under Rabin, I don't know if you know this, Rabin wasn't a great general in terms of like a Frederick the Great type, but he was excellent at organizing and staff work of the army. And what he did was he really significantly improved the personnel situation of the Israeli army. He increased the amount of training, which you know is extremely important. And he uh, worked on, it's like, it's like a principal sometimes will do a school. You know, if you had weak, it used to be, I'll just give an example. You, you know, under Diana and the others, they had uh, Ashkenazi units and Sephardi units. That's what it boiled down. They didn't call it that. And uh, these are the strong ones and these are the weak ones. And so the Ashkenazi units, they'll be in the, you know, for, for the front lines. And the Sephardi units, well, you know them, they, they'll, they'll be for the rear work. And uh, Rabin came in, he said, no. We have to mix it together, find the top group of the Sparta, mix it in with the Ashkenazim, and then work on the next top group left over, work it in there, put extra time and planning into manpower. It's not my area, but you call it HR, I guess, you know. Um, you know you, right? Give me resources. And, uh, and he significantly increased the quality of the Israeli infantry. Um, under Rabin, he put in General Gur in charge of the tanks. And I'll just to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, they made it that everybody in the tank corps knows all four jobs. There's a driver and a shooter and a this and a that. And the weakness of the system is if somebody gets killed, the whole thing gets messed up. And that's what you do in all the armies. There's just four guys and they have the training for what they have. But you understand he trained each guy to be a radio man and it's how to shoot and how to drive and how to whatever. And uh, that way uh, you tremendously increase the efficiency of your corps, even though it costs a lot more money for the training. So I'm just saying that people didn't realize, if you were on the outside, that Israel was seriously strengthening itself in the early 60s and the years, last years of Ben-Gurion. But of course, if you're Israel, you look at the map and you say, the Arabs are so big and strong, and we're so small, and therefore they're always freaking out. Having gotten the Hawk weapons, now that it was Johnson, Israel pushed the new president for tanks. Israel had, from the British, these centurion tanks. Uh, now, I'm not a tank expert, but based on, but, but, but I know we have some people here that are, but they'll confirm what I'm about to say. The Centurion tank is a good tank, especially uh, it's got a Rolls-Royce engine, and, uh, and Israel put extra cannon, uh, long cannon on it. But it's not as good as the Russian tanks. This is the problem. Nasser got the T-54s and T-55s. That was the better tanks. If you know anything about World War II, and I know many people here do, the Russians were famous for having the T-34 tank. That destroyed the Germans. They had nothing to match it. The Germans actually had, contrary to the movies, Germans actually had lousy tanks in World War II. <laughs> Hear that? They had lousy tanks in World War II. They couldn't get it right. The Russians, you know, tried this, that, and the other under Stalinism, and they found one tank that worked Gewaldic. It could run in the water, it could run in the snow, it could shoot here, there, and the other. It had the right amount of armor, and it was by far the best tank in World War II. This is a Dover Yadua. And that was a T 34. So here's a T 54. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? So, uh, in all the battles, the T-54 destroyed the Centurion tanks, except the Six-Day War. And that's because Israel compensated for it with the excellence of the training. To be perfectly honest, the Germans did that in World War II also, even though they had the worst tanks. The, the coordination with the air power and the, I don't know, all the other military stuff, they were able to manufacture for it. Now, look how technical I've gotten in the last two minutes. That was the state of American-Israeli relations in the mid-60s under Johnson. It got very technical because they wanted specific weapons, and they said, oh, you gave us the Hawk missile, now what about this? By the way, I just want to tell you something. Israel never used the Hawk missiles, Lamaisa. Actually, they used it once in a tragic way. In the 67 war, one of the Israeli planes, after bombing the Egyptian Air Force, came back and went in the wrong place near Demona. They, they weren't sure, and they shot a missile, destroyed it. Right? So it's almost like irony. They put so much time and effort in the Hawk missile, and then they, they killed their own guy with it. Anyhow, so Eshkol says to Johnson, listen, I want one of those. <laughs> Give me uh, uh, the best American tanks, which was, the Amer th this was the American tank, which was designed to beat the T-54. Get it? 
That's how it worked in the Cold War. They built something, we built something to back that, they built something the best, it went with the missiles, with the planes, and with the tanks, right? Like I say, I know there are a few people in this audience who know what I'm talking about because they worked at it. It's, uh, but this, in Israel, so I guess we've got to stay ahead of the eight ball, right? Can't let the Russians get the better tanks, so then we'd be destroyed. Now, Dean Russ said, I guess we cannot do this. The Arabs will go nuts and it'll totally discombobulate the Middle East. I'm not saying he's wrong about that, right? Um, now, the Jews said, you're an anti-Semite. It's not anti-Semite. It's, it's, you know, if you do this, then they'll get more of those, and we'll have to do this. It's just a spiraling arms race. Um, but Israel, especially under Johnson, they call Fortis, they call Arthur Goldberg, they call Judd Novi and all the rest of it. Next thing you know, the White House said, I like guess, this is very typical of Johnson. We won't sell Israel tanks. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to sell tanks to Germany. <laughs> and then Germany, off the books, will send it to Israel. <laughs> and so LBJ, it's, un- it's unbelievable, right? Germany at that time was still under the CDU, the Christian Democratic Party. Here's the famous Conrad Adenauer, who was in office until 64, I think, at, at the age of 99 or something like that, right? I love Germany in politics. In America, Obama ran under the, under the slogan, change. In Germany, they ran under the slogan, no change. <laughs> kind of experiment, right? Vote for Adenauer. By the way, he won every election. No change. <laughs> um, it's almost like a joke about Orthodox rabbis. Now, uh, <laughs> his successor was Ludwig Erhard. Ludwig Erhard was the economic genius who made the German Wirtschaftswunder, what they call the, the economic miracle. You know, Germany economy took off. And uh, they were both pro-Israel for a variety of reasons. Ben-Gurion kissed up them. They felt bad about the Holocaust. Now, Ludwig Erhard was very uncomfortable with getting involved in this kind of arms race because they'll get all the Arabs angry at Germany and they were selling them all the VWs and things like that. But Johnson said, I really need your help, you know. And, uh, and so he did it. Now, it was all based on the idea that this will be silent and nobody will find anything about it. And the result is that uh, Shimon Paris and Eshkol, uh, you know, went to Germany secretly, uh, Paris did, and the deal was made, and they sent the tanks to Germany, and then they, like, repackaged them or something like that, and sent in the M48s to Israel. The problem is, the whole thing was, was provided with a secret. It's Israel. <laughs> in Yiddish, it's the expression, a sold for guns broad, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's a secret that everybody knows. And so when it leaks out, Nasser got furious. So this was the big crisis of 65. He said, I'll show you. He recognized East Germany. Now, West Germany was the Adnauer. East Germany was a Russian satellite. According to West Germany, East Germany does not exist. It's a Russian province. It doesn't exist. And they even had a doctrine. Anybody recognize East Germany, we break relations with them. But Nazi said, well, I'm recognizing them, and the heck with you. And so this was the worst nightmare. And therefore, Nazi invited the head of East Germany to Cairo, which freaked out the Germans. And this set up a whole train of international crises, which I'll have to address in another uh, context over here, but Germany canceled the tanks. They say, you told, you, it was all provided that you wouldn't tell. Okay? Israel, of course, freaks out. You promised the tanks. And Johnson's going, uh, you know. And uh, on the other hand, the Johnson administration was unprecedentedly pro-Israel. And whereas Kennedy and Eisenhower and Truman would never formally meet the Israeli prime minister, um, if there are pictures, I mean, uh, let's put it this way. When Ben-Gurion used to come to Washington, he would go to the way. They didn't invite him. I mean, they did not invite him. But there was no such thing as a 21-gun salute and a formal recognition of Israel. He just showed up as a working leader. So they're not going to, you know, they'll have a discussion with him. But it's very clear the whole thing is keyed down. Kennedy was even more sensitive to this. He only would meet with Ben-Gurion at the Waldorf Astoria. And as he saw, he only met with Golda Meir at the house of a friend in, in Florida. So they're really trying to say, you know, tone it down. But Johnson, uh, under his uh, way of thinking, uh, so I guess, no, Israel's our friend, you know, and, and it was a, 1964, was an election year. That is a wonderful piece I found, it's online. It's an Arab uh, translation. <laughs> okay, you don't need, to, you'll understand the pictures. But it's a, Eshkol's unprecedented uh, visit June 64 to the White House with the full treatment, which is why, which, which is by saying like this, Israel's our friend. Washington, D.C. At the Blair House? Linton, 
He's going to John F. Kennedy's grave. LBJ. Okay. You get the idea. Now, Kennedy would have said, let's start with a lochen cup. You know, it's, it's, it's enough that we're uh, secret friends and all the rest. So, you know, what, what do you have to... And Johnson had a different answer. He says, is it friendly? No, I'm, I'm not ashamed of this. Well, uh, what was the result? Um, there were a lot of results. First of all, what was interesting is the two leaders got along very well because <laughs> both of them were very sneaky politicians. Here's Eskol's... Well, look at Eskol's famous statement, the next one. Which is exactly something could have written by LBJ. You understand? <laughs> sure, I promise, but I never promise to keep the promise. Okay? Uh, the State Department freaked out. They're very upset with the new President Johnson. He tries during his administration to accommodate the State Department. He wasn't totally stupid, you know? Um, but, and it's a basic feature of his presidency that he tries to adhere to an even handed policy and to tell Israel when they're doing wrong. But everybody could tell by the body language, physically and by his communications, that his heart is not really in it. So even when he told Israel we're outraged and this and that, which he did, but Israel could say like it's okay, you like to now let's talk about something else. And uh, this is a key element of what it was. I might remind you um, that you know, Johnson, for example, at, when he visits with um, uh, Eshkol visits there, he says, because he has to, State Department says, what's with Demona? Right? I plan to make a nuclear bomb over there, and Eshkol says, Israel won't be the first to introduce the bomb, but we won't be the second. <laughs> Right? Which sounds better in Yiddish. You understand? But, but I'm going to tell you something. Johnson said like this. Okay, that's the next, next item on the agenda. See? Where Kennedy would have said, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a completely different tone. Eshko, during the whole time, says to Johnson, listen, we want tanks, we want missiles. Missiles, okay? Uh, Johnson uh, said, well, wait a minute, missiles? What are the missiles for? You make an A-bomb thing, so it's a missiles? You know, the State Department... Uh, forced Israel to close down the missiles because then the Arabs would have then got uh, nuclear missiles from Russia. So, so the, the dynamics, I'm trying to convey to you a little bit of the complexity of the dynamics of the middle. You can't just say I'm pro-Israel and pro-this or the other. There's always, you know, you make this move on the chessboard and then something else happens as a result of it. Um, the sophisticated Shimon Peres tries to explain Israel's position. And it went as follows. A balance of weapons tempts the Arab rulers into war. They're emotional and they're unstable, right? Only a preponderance of Israeli power deters war. Now, Perez was right, as the Six-Day War demonstrated, meaning that because in 1967 the Arabs felt that there was a rough parity between the two sides, they didn't hesitate to go to war. If Israel would have had ten times the weapons, the Arabs wouldn't go to war. I mean, it boils down to that. But America said, I guess, where's it going? You know, you get you another 100 tanks, they give the Russians 100 tanks, another 5,000 planes, another 1,000 planes. But Paris was not wrong. And Nixon picked this up, and ever since Nixon, the United States had made sure Israel has a preponderance of military power, and that's the reason there's been no major war since Nixon between states. Israel has a lot of asymmetric problems, we know that, I mean, that's obvious. But Israel has not gone to war, a war war. We forget this in, uh, in I should say, poo poo poo, in uh, 40 years. You hear what I said? Israel's not had a major war in 40 years. They went into Lebanon on their own. they fighting an intifada, you know, that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like 48, 67, you know, a war war. And it's because, although Johnson, even Johnson didn't quite see it that way, but after Johnson, the U.S. came to see it that way. Uh, that's actually Kissinger's doing, but we'll talk about that later. But uh, it's not a sign of kissing up to Israel unless there's a preponderance of weight on the side of Israel, the other nations will be tempted to war because that's the sta- unstable nature of the Arab world. It, it is what it is. Um, but LBJ could only do this, satisfy Israel, at the expense of completely losing the Arab world. And that's what he did. 
in the Johnson administration, by the time it was over, when he left off in 69, no country except maybe Jordan and Saudi Arabia reluctantly uh, had any relations with America. All the other countries were in Russia's camp. So instead of, like Truman and Eisenhower, trying to keep the Russians out of the Middle East, by the time Johnson finished, America was out of the Middle East. So, so there's a price to pay. On the other hand, in the good old 1960s, the USA was not vulnerable to an Arab oil boycott. Anybody remember this? You old enough to remember that? Okay. And what else they do? They, 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 they fix your tires, and they washed under the, the, under the hood, right? And then you, and they gave you prizes, all for 20 cents. Okay, it's amazing. No, my point is like this. At, that, at the time of Johnson, we still got our oil from Texas. So, uh, the U- USA. So Saudi Arabia was not in a position to say, we'll cut you off. Was it cut me off? Many people don't know this. At the Six-Day War, Saudi Arabia declared a boycott. And Johnson says, so? You see, it didn't work. Now, six years later, we used up all our oil. Now we're dependent on the Arabs. Then it was a different story altogether, altogether unfortunately. But in Johnson's time, it wasn't like that. We still had the cheap gas. Uh, a big issue during Johnson's post-election and a- after 64 was Jordan, which was an American ally but an Israeli enemy. Jordan, as you know, owned the West Bank and Jerusalem. People f- perhaps forget, but I want to show you something I found from the British uh, TV. Here's a picture. They're visiting the city of Jerusalem, including you'll see King Hussein walking around the Kotel, I mean the um, Harabayas, the Mosque of Omar, uh, in 66, when uh, things would be so great. And uh, you'll notice, if you pay attention, how sparsely populated the Arab city is. Okay? The Jewish one also. And since it's British, they're not too crazy about the Jews either. Take a look. A model city, if ever there was one. This, though, is a mockery. This is Jerusalem the Golden. The Jerusalem that King Solomon conceived in all its splendor. Reconstructed in the cracked and broken Jerusalem of today. This is wishful thinking or nostalgia, or sheer irony. Jerusalem, the Jewish Holy of Holies, which went on to cradle Christianity, and after sacking to become the place where Muhammad rose to his Arabic heaven in his turn. How could Jerusalem have failed to become the split and divided center of a modern world in desperate disunity? Almost 200,000 Jews inhabit this torn off section of a city which is at war with itself. Recognize the streets? Religious fanatics, naturally, are among the millions scattered Jews who returned to their promised land. And even friendly cameramen are spurned in this capital, which became a cauldron of hate when Palestine was divided between Arab and Jew in 1948, because it was cut in two so implacably that a stranger is regarded as an enemy on either side. Yet this is the site of King David's tomb, Jerusalem's Jewish founder, who figured biblically in the whole background of both Christianity and the Muslim faith. Tragic the way today, David's great city should be both a center of piety and passionate strife. In that museum, they housed the Dead Sea Scrolls, ancient heritage of both Jew and Christian, discovered in Bedouin country, preserved but always threatened by the blindness of frontline guns. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Those scrolls allude to the conflict of good and evil, truth and falsehood. Their title, the Book of War. And what a deceivingly peaceful place for them to be lodged, because that wall was built as a frontier between enemies. Peace here is a false impression, because it simply asserts itself between armies which, when not in action, are actively alert across a no-man's land of barbed wire, bitterness and non-coexistence. A city split completely... Elsewhere, there is parleying and even partnership between the creeds and races and nations. Here, passion proves too great because here there are monuments to the very atavistic roots that tear people apart. That Dome of the Rock has been both a Christian church and a Muslim shrine. The King of Jordan was given sovereignty here where Abram prepared to sacrifice his son Isaac, where Solomon built his temple, and where later Mohammed spiritually rose to heaven to commune with the earlier prophets, Kotel. among whom he acknowledged Jesus. Empty. Yet in this civilized day and age, even though Jordan has a westernized king of great culture and humanity, this holy city, which should be emulsive, is explosive. Why can't Jerusalem belong to all of us, Arab, Christian, Jew, and Hindu too, if he likes? Because here's a place in Jordan that only fervent Jews want. 
the Wailing Wall, where they were wont to pray and where the last stones of Solomon's great temple survive. The Shuk is not crowded. This wall also contains stones that Herod laid. Jews used to nail their prayers for the restoration of their temple and kingdom into it. Here, now a school courtyard, Pilate washed his hands of responsibility for Jesus' death. Okay. You get the rest. If you're interested, you can find it yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm serious about that. Um, so we didn't have, there were no Jews in East Jerusalem. There were no Jews in the West Bank. It was uh, Jordan, and they were in charge of a tricky border over there. King Hussein's big problem was not Israel, it was Nasser. Therefore, in the year, in 63, um, King Hussein started to have secret conversations with Israel. Uh, very uh, dangerous and very sneaky. I would say in general, under Eshkol, they, they, they started a policy of having secret con- conversations with certain Arab leaders, which couldn't get out. Now, Yaakov Herzog, who was a from guy, was the director general of uh, Eshkol's bureau, as they called it. He was the director general of the prime minister's ministry, as the expression is. He was a top Israeli diplomat, and he met a bunch of times with King Hussein at a dentist's office in London. because a Jewish dentist. King Hussein, a Jewish dentist. Okay, listen, he's not crazy. So, uh, and um, because King Hussein's mother used them, it's the whole story. But at the end of the story is that they start having these things, and basically, King Hussein's like this help America, persuade America I should get weapons I need against Nasser, and we should try to settle any kind of border disputes that are coming in here, in other words, in terms of uh, shootings. This went on through 1963 to 67. It did not prevent Hussein from attacking Israel in 67. Welcome to the Middle East, my friends. Now, Hussein wants tanks and American planes. Israel objects. They said they'll be used against us. Johnson says, what? Don't you want a stable Jordan? Don't you want King Hussein there? Would an overthrown Jordan be better for Israel? Um, he sent Avril Harriman, famous American statesman, to Israel. And Harriman elicits a promise from King Hussein, we won't use the tanks against Israel, which is greatly humiliating for King Hussein. Because you give me the weapons, I can use whatever I want. Just have to trust me. And it's not even true. Because despite all the promise in 67, you and I know they used all these uh, tanks and stuff like this against Israel. The only good news is that Israel beat them and took all the tanks. All the M48s. They sent 60 M48s to Israel. Israel blew up 30 and the other 30 they captured. Okay, so this is how it went. Now, as we'll see, the situation between Israel and Jordan was a constant irritant to U.S.-Israel relations during Johnson's administration. I have to turn that another night. At the same time, it was clear to all that the U.S. government was becoming more and more openly pro-Israel under Johnson. The Arabs could obviously see the Jewish influence on Johnson, which wasn't incorrect. I mean, like, here's him with Abe Fortas. You know? Nasser became extremely bitter. He burned the U.S. He allowed crowds to burn the U.S. library in Cairo, which didn't endear him to the Americans. And uh, basically he's saying... You said that if Israel attacks, she will be completely destroyed. Yeah. And some Arab leaders actually say that their aim is the elimination of Israel without any qualification. Now, what well, does this mean? If, if somebody attacks you, yeah. what would be your reaction? Somebody attacks us, we will react. React in war means destruction. When you were, when you were in war with Germany, your object was to destroy your enemy. At your press conference a few days ago, Mr. President, you really were very tough against the United States. Will you say in a, a bit more detail, what is it that's uh, really angered you? Well, mainly the problem is that the United States is siding with Israel and neglecting completely the Arabs and the rights of the Arabs. We want a big power like the United States to be just, and to be fair in dealing with all the world, not to mix with the internal uh, uh, politics or the voices of, voices of the Jews and neglecting the rights of the Arabs. That's why all, all the Arab people are feeling terribly toward the United States because the United States is siding with Israel. He basically said, why are you siding up with Israel and, and, and taking off the Arabs? Are you stupid? And he went farther than that. And look, what he, look what he said in his slogan. <laughs> right? He says, you're genius. You make... You don't make clear-cut stupid moves. You make complicated stupid moves. It makes you wonder what, what's happening over there. Because that's the Middle East. You know, so everything's conspiracy theory. Why are they doing this? You're doing this because it is this. For example, most of the Arabs today in the Middle East are convinced that ISIS is a Mossad plot. I'm serious. 
The same way that they're absolutely certain that who, who, wait a minute, you go in the Middle East and ask who blew up Paris today? So obviously the Jews, you know that. I mean, because they knew it would do this, that, they could tell. And you look at me and say, Are you crazy? That's how they think. And how you think is what counts. Um, Nasser's uh, speeches actually were good for Israel because they showed what they're like. Here, here's a speech when he expressed his anger at Johnson. Very famous speech. For America, we get meat and wheat and leftover. We don't get any factories. If the Americans think that they can give us a little aid to dominate us and control our policy, I tell them to drink up the sea, which in Arabic means go to hell. Uh, if the Mediterranean is not large enough, they can drink the Red Sea too. We can't sell independence for money. We are a hot-tempered people. Israel selling it. Thank you. <laughs> you understand? This is, this is because this gets on the news. And so Nasser more or less uh, dug himself deeper and deeper in there. But it was bad for peace. And here I come to my final remarks. By 1966, which is when I'm closing, the USA no longer had any influence with Nasser. And the Russians were a negative influence, making Nasser feel strong and cocky. Here is uh, Khrushchev. Yeah, here's Khrushchev on a 16-day visit to Egypt. They dedicated the, the Aswan Dam and all this kind of stuff, and they got chummy. And I love this part, by the way. <laughs> Russia, Egypt, they're going to give him a special present for Nasser, a new Russian car. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Ronald Reagan when you need it over here? And you, if you look at the smiles of the Egyptian faces, they're going to like, oh my God, you know, something like that. He's showing off this great new car. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> you know, there's no... Have anybody ever been on Aeroflot on the airplanes or something like that? So I was. Anyhow, but the point is that Russia's selling them weapons galore. Uh, Egypt was, by that time, giving away all their cotton crop to Russia. It was bad. Although Johnson agreed with Kennedy's policy of engaging with the Arabs in order to prevent the Middle East from blowing up, he was not good at it. And the Middle East unraveled into war in 1967. Although officially Johnson was committed to an even-handed policy, it was too obvious to everyone, to everyone that he was emotionally pro, too pro-Israel. Okay? I leave you with this uh, caption from the founder of Apex, Cy Kennan, who was the great uh, lobbyist for Israel in the 50s, and the 60s, early 70s. He wrote a very interesting book. And look what he says over here. During the first term of a new presidential term, the petro-diplomatic complex invariably pressures the incoming administration to downgrade Israel and court Arab friendship. This is true in every year except 65. Uh, the head of APEC, when, when President Johnson was beyond Arab reach. This was, to, uh, let's put it this way, it's such a thing called too good. Why do I say that? Because who was better for Israel, Kennedy or Johnson? It's, it's, it's an interesting question. Do you understand what I'm saying? Johnson was more overtly pro-Israel, but being too much turned out to trigger a war. So it's a very complex question, all right? And it's food for thought when we think about Obama. He thinks this way. He says, I don't want to get too much this way. I don't want to get too much. Obama is a throwback to Kennedy, to Eisenhower. I got your back, as he said, but I don't want to overdo it. And if I want to make a deal with Iran or this other country, Israel shouldn't try and interfere. And Bibi keeps trying to, you know, shepherd on, and there, that, that characterizes the tensions that are inherent currently in the U.S.-Israel relationship. I do believe, if you ask my personal opinion, I do believe that Obama thinks he's, he's doing the best thing for Israel. He just doesn't agree with Israel's assessment of it, and I'm sure he says that Israel's just like a, a jealous girl. You understand? Now, if he's right, he's right. If he's wrong, we're all in trouble. Good night.